Today I will discuss integration of intracardiac echocardiography and three-dimensional mapping for atrial fibrillation ablation or the use of cardiosound technology in atrial fibrillation ablation. Both 3D electroanatomical mapping and intracardiac echocardiography are accepted imaging modalities used to guide catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmias. Advantages of intracardiac echo include real-time imaging, ability to monitor catheter tip position and stability, as well as catheter tissue interface and monitor for complications during the procedure. Disadvantages. Unfortunately, intracardiac echo provides us with only a two-dimensional image. We are unable to tag ablated and landmark sites, and in certain views it is difficult to image the catheter tip because of reverberation artifact. Advantages of 3D electroanatomical mapping include the ability to manipulate the catheter in non-fluoroscopic space, ability to tag ablated and landmark sites, and ability to register pre-acquired CT and MRI images. Unfortunately, most of the time this type of mapping relies on point-by-point -point acquisition, and previously acquired anatomy may be outdated and inaccurate at the time of the procedure. This brings us to the cardiosound technology. Cardiosound technology involves the use of an intracardiac echo catheter with a positional sensor embedded close to the ultrasound array, whereby one can acquire ECG or electrogram-gated intracardiac echo images along with positional information for each image. Contours traced on intracardiac echo images are then displayed in 3D space and summed into 3D structures. Using this technology, between February and May 2007, we ablated 15 patients with atrial fibrillation. All were men, 57 or so years of age. Ten of them had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, five failed class 1 antiarrhythmics, seven sotalol, nine amiodarone, and two failed dofetilide. This image uh, shows you image acquisition and 3D map construction using cardiosound technology. On the left, you can see a frozen intracardiac echo image. During each acquisition, three seconds of intracardiac echocardiography are recorded. During this time, one can acquire a number of gated images of the cardiac structures of interest. In this case, the left atrium was viewed into the left upper pulmonary vein. The middle panel shows a number of uh, contours thus traced on a number of gated images displayed in three-dimensional space. One can also see the cardiosound probe projected in the right atrium. Panel C then shows a filled 3D reconstruction showing the body of the left atrium, pulmonary veins, and the left atrial appendage. This panel shows that we can not only image the cardiac structures, but we can also image very important extra cardiac structures such as the esophagus. The red lines in the panel on the left outline the esophagus as it courses behind the left atrium. The panel on the right then shows the esophagus in three-dimensional space behind the posterior wall of the left atrium. In green one can see the shell of the left atrium, and in gray bodies of the left atrial appendage, left common pulmonary vein, le right superior and right inferior pulmonary veins. Unfortunately, we found that although the contours are acquired in real time and likely represent the real unperturbed anatomy of the left atrium, once ablation lesions were delivered, a number of uh, times the ablation lesions were beyond the contours, particularly along the roof and the anterior wall of the right atrium, likely representing distortion from pressing against the uh, uh, wall of the left atrium with a relatively stiff catheter. Ablation was carried out using the pulmonary vein antrum isolation approach represented in this lesion set. A circular mapping catheter placed in the left atrium is initially placed at the border between the left atrial appendage and the left upper pulmonary vein. It is then used to scan the entire antrum of uh, each pulmonary vein, starting from the ridge with the left pulmonary veins and the uh, left atrial appendage, 
and going across the roof and the back wall of the left atrium, across the antra of the right pulmonary veins and to the septum. In our patients, once the PVAI lesion set was complete, if the patients were still in atrial fibrillation, complex atrial electrograms were mapped and ablated. In several patients with history of atrial flutter, additional lesions were delivered ac across the cava tricuspid isthmus with the endpoint of bidirectional block across the isthmus. In seven patients, the SVC was isolated along its junction with the right atrium. At the end of the procedure, the patients were either spontaneously in sinus rhythm or were converted into sinus rhythm. In sinus rhythm, all pulmonary veins and the SVC junction were remapped. It took an average of 51 minutes to create maps using cardiosound technology without fluoroscopy and from about 46 contours, including contours of the pulmonary veins, esophagus, and the left atrial appendage. An average case took about 234 minutes to complete, with a total fluoroscopy time of 65 minutes and radiofrequency delivery time of nearly 90 minutes per case. Although the actual mapping phase of the ablation was carried out without fluoroscopy, we had to use fluoroscopy to track the position of the circular mapping catheter around the pulmonary vein antra. Since using cardiac software, we were not able to see it in non-fluoroscopic space. This accounted for most of fluoroscopy exposure during these procedures. At 10 months of follow-up, 73% of our patients were free of atrial fibrillation of antiarrhythmic medications after the initial three months blanking period. And so we conclude that a mapping system combining intracardiac echo and 3D electroanatomical mapping can feasibly reconstruct the 3D shell of the left atrium and the esophagus. Ablation guided using this approach appears to be safe and effective in a small group of patients with a variety of atrial fibrillation substrates.